Do you think that psychopaths who laugh in their victims' faces only exist in movies? Believe me, they don't. My name is Knox, and today I'll show you killers who taunted relatives and victims right in the courtroom. At the end, there will even be a father who stabbed his son with a knife. Do you know what he said to him? Oh, you better watch till the end. Let's go in order. The story of Isabel Martinez shocked the public with her strange statements in court. What did she do? She adamantly insisted on her innocence and claimed that a few days before she killed her family in July 2017 in Gwinnett County, Georgia, she felt the presence of an evil spirit. On that fateful day, Isabel attacked her husband, Martin Romero, and didn't stop until he stopped breathing, despite his pleas for mercy. But the nightmare didn't end there. Martinez turned her twisted attention to her own children, killing four of them. During questioning, the sole surviving girl, Diana, told investigators that her mother explained her actions by saying she wanted to send them to heaven to be with Jesus. The family had recently moved from Chicago to Gwinnett County, and those around them thought they were very close and friendly. However, after Isabel's father's death, everything went downhill. She became deeply immersed in grief and obsessively thought about reuniting with him in the afterlife. It turned out that Isabel suffered from severe paranoia and was convinced that evil spirits were hunting her. Her mental state worsened every day. On that terrible night, it was evident that something was seriously wrong with Isabel. After committing the unthinkable, she did something strange. She placed Bibles on the bodies of her murdered relatives. When it was all over, Martinez readily admitted her actions in court, but she genuinely believed she did it out of love and was sending her family to eternal salvation. During the trial, her behavior and actions seemed completely inappropriate. Why? She continued to laugh and smile in court, waving her hands, showing a cross on her face, and even giving the jury a thumbs up. And this guy, although he didn't kill his children, dealt with his wife and father-in-law. 42-year-old Tiffany Ferguson decided to end her 17-year marriage to Keith Ferguson. During an argument about the divorce, Keith attacked Tiffany, shooting her in front of their four children. Keith then took the children to Tiffany's parents' house, where he fatally shot her father. After killing his father-in-law, Keith fled to a nearby house, took a 59-year-old woman hostage, and barricaded himself inside. The situation lasted seven hours before Keith surrendered and released the hostage. In court, Keith showed no remorse for his actions. During the trial, Ferguson appeared bored, frequently cursing at the judge, court officials, and everyone present. Before the sentencing, Tiffany's best friend, Carla Sitting, read a victim impact statement. She noted that Tiffany lived in fear of Keith and knew he was dangerous. During the hearing, Keith stated that he didn't want to see or communicate with his children. For the sake of self-respect and the safety of my children, I will not say anything because they will see it. They don't need to hear it, he said, which prompted Judge George Mertz to question his sanity. As part of a plea deal, Keith pleaded guilty to the murders of his wife and father-in-law, and the remaining 10 charges were dropped. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And what about this guy? During the trial, TJ Lane simply smiled and at one point even gave the victim's families the middle finger. His statement in court was so obscene that it couldn't be fully aired. What did he do? On February 27, 2012, at Chardon High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it was a regular Friday. Students were going about their business according to the school schedule, and nothing foreshadowed the disaster. Everything changed when TJ Lane suddenly entered the building. He approached a table where four of his friends were sitting and unexpectedly pulled out a small 22 caliber pistol. The consequences were horrifying. Three lives were tragically cut short, and another student, Nick Walsack, was left paralyzed. The emotional trauma from this event affected the entire school and many students later sought therapy to cope with the tragedy. In March 2013, the court found Lane guilty and sentenced him to three life terms without the possibility of parole. 
Lane attempted to use claims of auditory hallucinations and past abuse as a defense, but his behavior during the trial was extremely disturbing. He showed complete lack of remorse, wore a t-shirt with the word killer, and openly mocked the seriousness of his actions, taunting the grieving families of the victims. In September 2014, Lane, along with two accomplices, attempted to escape from the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. Their plan failed, and Lane was recaptured and returned to prison the next day. To enhance security, all three were quickly transferred to the Ohio State Penitentiary, where conditions were much stricter. And what about the cannibal grandmother, who cursed everyone in the courtroom and mocked the mother of the girl she ate? Meet Sofia Ivanovna Jukova. How could someone who had lived alongside others for decades commit such terrible acts under the guise of a harmless old lady? Zhukova's story makes you wonder how little we really know about those around us. Sofia Ivanovna was born in 1939 and spent most of her life in the small village of Beryozovka near Khabarovsk. A former slaughterhouse worker on a pig farm, she knew how to handle an axe, which later led to dire consequences. After her husband's death, she became more withdrawn and aggressive, especially towards children, whose noise she couldn't tolerate. The disappearance of little Nastya Aleksinko in 2005 was the first serious signal that a maniac might be nearby. Nastya entered her building with Jukova, which was the last anyone saw of her. Despite the grandmother's friendly stories about tea parties and drawing with Nastya, the reality was much darker. The discovery of bones in a dump and the disappearance of others who temporarily lived or interacted with Jukova only raised more questions. It was strange that the police didn't pay attention to these strange coincidences, and the woman was only detained in 2019 when her friend and a janitor had already disappeared while visiting her. By the way, the granny then flaunted her friend's clothes around the yard, but even this didn't convince the police. Only after searches and the discovery of meat preparations from former friends was the grandmother detained. Interestingly, until her death in 2020, Jukova never fully admitted her guilt despite the accusations and evidence found by the police. Her death left many questions unanswered, and the case was never fully resolved, leaving only a shadow of doubt and unresolved mysteries. And here's 19-year-old Shondell Jackson, who was awaiting sentencing and faced life imprisonment for murder. What did he do? On July 6, 2009, Nathan Potter, a 21-year-old senior at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, encountered Shondell and his friend Derek Thomas while returning to his apartment in the Riverwest neighborhood near campus. Nathan had no idea that this unexpected encounter would change his life forever. Shondell and Derek planned to rob him. Threatening Nathan with a gun, they demanded his money. When Nathan honestly replied that he had no money, Shondell mercilessly shot him, killing him instantly. Both criminals faced the deserved punishment. The trial of Shondell attracted great attention due to his astonishing lack of remorse. He often smirked and made rude gestures at Nathan's grieving family. On one occasion, Jackson even smiled at them as he was led out of the courtroom. During the trial, Nathan's mother, Denise, addressed the judge, highlighting how coldly Shondell behaved. The 19-year-old Shondell was found guilty of first-degree murder and robbery. The judge considered him a significant threat, suggesting that he would resort to violence again and did not value human life. Shondell was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentencing was not without drama. Shondell challenged Nathan's family with his gaze, leading to a confrontation with officers. Chaos ensued in the courtroom until he was taken out. Both families were overwhelmed with emotions and cried. Shondell's partner in crime, Derek, pleaded guilty and received 12 years in prison. Why so little? He simply testified against his accomplice. Here's another criminal who Clea. He early felt no remorse during his trial, Danta Wright was caught on camera, smiling as the verdict was read. The judge, fed up with his indifferent behavior, unexpectedly halted the proceedings. How did it all start? 
On October 4, 2016, Jordan Keon, a talented player on the Pioneer High School football team, tragically lost his life. It was the first murder in the city in a year, causing a wave of panic throughout the local community. The main culprit behind this horrific tragedy was a teenager named Danta Wright, along with two accomplices. They decided to rob Jordan, but everything went horribly wrong when Danta shot Jordan in the back of the head for no apparent reason. Jordan's mother had to sit just a few feet away from the person who took her son's life and listen to his cold, detached account of that terrible day. Imagine how hard it must have been for her. Danta recounted the story so coldly and distantly, it seemed he felt no remorse at all. He even smiled during the sentencing, saying, I just want to say I'll be home soon. Rest in peace, Keon. I love my family. As the victim's relatives read their statements, Wright laughed and kept smiling. This deeply shook Judge David Schwartz from Washtenaw County. He said, In my 23 years, I have always honored plea agreements reached by both parties, but seeing you laugh and act as if this is not serious makes me reconsider my decision. I might send you for a retrial with a harsher sentence. The prosecutor stated that Wright was a gang member who bragged about his actions in his rap songs. However, Wright's lawyer argued that these were just songs and that the lyrics didn't necessarily reflect real life. Jeremy Christian, who was arrested for the murder of two men on the Max Light Rail Train in Portland in May 2017. Christian stabbed retired Army officer Ricky John Best and 23-year-old Taliesin Murden Namkai Meche. He also injured 21-year-old Micah Fletcher, who survived. It all started when Christian was caught on video shouting anti-Muslim and racist slurs at two black teenagers. His behavior outraged several passengers, who stood up for the frightened teens and tried to protect them by moving them to the back of the train. Attempts to de-escalate the situation led Christian to draw a knife and start attacking passengers. After the attack, he fled the scene, escaping at the next station. When the police arrived, Christian was arrested, and he boasted about killing two people. But this was just the beginning. In court, Christian's behavior left the judge and jury in complete bewilderment. He was charged with two murders and one attempted murder. Instead of showing any remorse, he threatened to kill one of the victim's relatives right in the courtroom. During the victim impact statement by one of the relatives, Christian shouted, I should have killed you, you expletive. I should have killed him. Ultimately, Christian was sentenced to two life terms. The trial also revealed details of his criminal past. The day before the murders, he had assaulted a woman and shouted racist slurs in another train. Christian described himself as a white nationalist and far-right extremist. The judge added another 25 years to his two life sentences for other charges. Fair enough, right? Remember, I promised a story about a father who stabbed his own son? This is Ronnie O'Neill the suspect in a double murder in Riverview, Florida. At the time of the crime, he was 29 years old. O'Neill shot his girlfriend, Kenyatta Barron, and then killed their daughter with multiple ax blows. The girl was only nine years old. He also stabbed their eight-year-old son, then doused himself in gasoline and set the house on fire. O'Neill was arrested while trying to escape from the burning house. The son survived, but suffered serious injuries and burns. The first 911 call came from Kenyatta Barron, who screamed before the call was cut off. Eight minutes later, the second call came from O'Neill. What's your emergency? I was just attacked by white demons inside. It's Kiki, her name is Kiki, and she tried to kill me. After his arrest, O'Neill underwent a psychological evaluation and was deemed competent to represent himself in court. During the trial, he personally cross-examined his 11-year-old son, whom he had previously stabbed. The boy recounted everything that had happened in detail. Good to see you, man. Did I hurt you that night? Yes. And how did I hurt you? You stabbed me. O'Neill also accused the prosecution of fabricating evidence. When he was found guilty, the judge noted that this was the most horrific case she had ever seen. This is the worst case in my experience. And I have seen a lot of horrors, she said. O'Neill also stated that he did not regret his actions. 
I do not regret what I did, and I do not regret what I did not do. O'Neill was sentenced to three life terms plus 90 years without the possibility of parole. O'Neill's son was adopted by a detective who took care of him the night of the murders. A truly noble act by a person with a big heart. What do you think? Share your opinion in the comments. And yes, if you love intricate cases and interesting stories, can edit videos, voiceover clips, or write scripts, make sure to visit our Telegram bot through the link in the description. We'd be happy to collaborate with you.